I got referred to a surgeon. He walked into the room and he had like a model heart in his hand. And the one thing he turned around and said to me was, OK, Mark, your heart's three, three times the size of what it should be. And if you don't get this operation done now, you're going to die this year. Because your heart is a muscle, it's grown and it's grown and it's going to get to a point where it's going to just stop. And being 16, I just the only question that I asked him was, can I still play football? Not a lot of people knew about it, but year after year that I had the heart operation, I had a heart scan every single season to see if I was allowed to play the following season. For a front, I put my hand straight out and I shook his hand and I said, yeah, can't wait to come in. But he didn't have to know how low on confidence I was because I didn't play for six months. Football is all I want. Like, this is all I want. If I can do this every single week, please let me do it. Going through what I went through, there was nothing that was going to stop me. Mark O'Brien, welcome to Engage. How are you, okay? Yeah, yeah, all good. And I just want to thank you for agreeing to uh, take part in the episode today. Um, it's really, really appreciated. So, just to give you a, a bit of a, a better introduction overall, uh, you are an ex-professional footballer, uh, fairly recently uh, retired. Uh, you've played for Derby County, Motherwell, Luton Town, Southport on two separate occasions and most recently uh, for Newport County where you were the club captain. Uh, according to Wikipedia you made 103 league appearances, you scored four goals, you also uh, appeared in the famous uh, FA Cup run that uh, Newport had in 2019 where you eventually uh, played and were knocked out by Man City. You've won two caps for Ireland under-19s. But in uh, 2020, you had to retire from the professional game at the age of just 27 uh, due to heart surgery. So that's something that uh, I want to talk about as well as um, your career uh, from Ireland all the way through to Newport. And um, I thought it would also be a good idea if we could have a chat about what you're up to now uh, now that uh, you've had to hang up um, your boots. Uh, so does all that sound uh, okay? Yeah, sounds perfect to me. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, perfect. So just before we uh, get into all of that then, if we could just get a bit of background about where you're from and uh, what it was like uh, growing up for you. Yeah, growing up was, was, was great for me. Um, I'm from a place called Ballyferma back in Dublin. Um, and as I said, uh, football back then was really, you, you take a ball to the streets and kick it against the wall for as many times as you want. And um, really enjoyed, really enjoyed me time back there. I still have all the same friends that I've had growing up from when I was five, six years of age till the present day. So, like I say, um, the community and everything that, like, are back at home everyone sticks really close together and I don't get home as often as I'd like to obviously living away but um, it's something that I do absolutely love uh, I do love doing but again growing up was, was great like I got to do loads of different things I got to play for my local team and it was just one step after the next um, as football progressed for me it was something that I knew I just I really wanted to do and like me, my parents, my brother, people in my family, like everyone was just so supportive of everything. So, like I said, I had a, I had a really good upbringing and I'm kind of thankful for it. So you were always playing football as a kid. Were you always playing um, in a defensive position or did you start off out as a, as a striker trying to score the goals and get all the glory or uh, how did that pan out? Um, when I was on like the younger ages, when you play on the small side of pitches, I was kind of a midfielder where I was the one that could kick the ball the furthest and stuff like that. So like I'd be the midfielder and everything was totally fine. But then when the pitches got bigger, um, I think the manager made the decision back in Ireland that maybe I wasn't um quick or fit enough to play in the uh, centre midfield. So he put me back as a centre back and I fell in love with it really. Um. They seen something in me, obviously, at that age that they probably knew that I could I could be a centre back. I wasn't the tallest or the quickest, but um, I kind of had that um, desire and I had that bit of bravery about me that I never minded sticking my head in places where people wouldn't put their feet. So 
when he made that choice for me it was a, it was a position that kind of just fell for me and I loved every minute of it but um, again growing up it wasn't until around the age of 11 12 years years old that I actually realized that I wanted football as an actual career I was always just playing for the fun of it and enjoying it for going down playing with my friends and giving me something to do but at around 11 12 years of age when I started to get noticed by a couple of other teams and a couple of other things that happened in Ireland um yeah I just I just knew that that was all I ever wanted and when you see people show trust in you or give you that confidence to kind of kick on and do amazing things that you don't realize yourself um it helped me massively so when you were taking things a bit more seriously then as you said around the age of about 11 or 12 were there any particular players that you admired or anybody that you modeled your own game on at the time well, I think it's like the like the typical Roy Keane. I was a Manchester United fan, and um, so obviously with him being Irish and and just how he kind of approached the game, you see how aggressive he is. You see that he doesn't take any rubbish off anybody, and he kind of applies himself right. And and it's it's somebody when growing up in Ireland, I wanted to be that player. I wanted to be the player that when I once I crossed the white line, I wasn't going to take rubbish off anyone. I was tough tackling. I wanted to be. Um, that presence on the pitch that people respected and um, yeah so I think Roy Keane growing up but then being a Manchester United fan once I kind of started taking it more serious and started to look at it more position specific um, Nemanja Vidic from Manchester United was another player that I looked up to and I wanted to mould my game around that where he was playing in the Premier League he would clear it when it needed to be cleared he'd fly into tackles he's, he'd head everything and I looked at it and just thought like that's that's the kind of person that I see myself as. So if I'm able to kind of get anywhere near that, even even a third of that, let alone um, any of it, then I know I'll be doing okay. So at what sort of age were you then, where you were starting to get noticed, perhaps by uh, teams in the UK? I was 14 years old when I started getting noticed by teams in the UK. Um, I was lucky enough that I was able to be out, out on trial. Um, I went to Blackburn, um, Manchester City and Liverpool. And it's kind of, back then, kind of those big names swoop in on, on people that they, they can just like pick out of um, every group in Ireland. And obviously with the name of Liverpool, Man City's and people like that, they nine times out of ten sign a lot of players. But... At the time, um, Derby County came in to me for a week. And when Derby came in, um, my very first trial for them was I literally I flew over on a Saturday morning at 11 o'clock to Liverpool. Um, I was only 14. And they were playing a game at 12 o'clock. So I landed at half 10, um, travelled straight from the airport to the game. I played with the under-15s. We won 3-2. I scored the winning goal and I flew back that night. And that was my first ever trial with, that, with Derby. And... They phoned me family to say they wanted me over for a week's trial. Um, and I was more than happy to do it. Like I say, I, I was not one of these that I looked at the name of a club and thought I have to go for a big name. I just wanted to go places to see if I'd enjoy it. And once I ended up going to Derby for that week, it was it was so eye-opening. It was a, felt just like home from home. It was literally, I felt comfortable the minute I was there. People around the building made me feel comfortable. The staff everybody who was around the place and like I say once once I ended up getting there um, it literally was a home from home and once I felt comfortable I knew that's where I wanted to be so I didn't care about anything else other than when I was going to get started at Derby. Yeah I've been to uh, Derby on uh, an away game with uh, Cardiff City and um, it's it's a Premier League setup but I know you, you mentioned there that looking at the, the team name and thinking you have to go to one of the the bigger clubs instead, but um, what they've got at, at Derby is a, a, a top-flight setup. Um, it's just just a shame they're just not uh, they're not playing there at the moment. But after you had your week's trial, how quick was it then before uh, Derby made a move for you to get you over there permanently? Um, well, once I had my week's trial, um, I still had my GCSEs, well, the equivalent of GCSEs to do in, in, in Ireland. So that same season when I was 14, um, by the end of that summer, I was going to do my GCSEs, which um, 
once I had them finished, then I was able to leave school and I was able to go over to, to Derby. So it was when I was 15 years old, I flew over in the summer that Derby um, ended up bringing me over. So I trained with the youth system when I flew over, which was um, the under 18s. But I was only allowed to play for the under 16s as I wasn't 100% registered for the club. I was still only a schoolboy. So it was um, until I turned November that year. And when I turned when I turned sixteen in November that year, and um, they were able to register me, and then I was able to just kick on. And just before we talk about your your debut there at the age of sixteen, uh, I I did want to ask you, what was it like then moving away from your home comforts in Ireland, uh, moving to England, at the age of of just sixteen, and presumably you were over here um, by yourself, all your family. Uh, still left at home so uh, how did you adapt to that um in all fairness i think i was one of the lucky ones that um the love for football took over uh like don't get me wrong i I missed my family all the time and i missed my friends all the time and it was something that at the beginning it felt slightly difficult but again it was still i knew i was training every day i was kicking a ball every day and it was what i wanted to do so I could have moved halfway around the world to Australia and I still would have uh, have moved there and gone and to play football. But um I just feel uh, like like I just always go back to when I said if it felt like a home from home. So I didn't feel like I needed to be homesick. I didn't feel as though I was I needed to to miss many people because I felt so comfortable at Derby and I think that was one of the best decisions that I made is picking a place that I could feel comfortable in rather than going for the actual name of the club and don't get me wrong I know Derby's a massive club and I know that they are really really um a lot of history to them but I just feel they made it feel so comfortable and so such a like home from home that um I was lucky that I didn't really struggle on on the homesickness aspect of it and do you think then because you did feel so comfortable at the club that helped you make what was quite remarkable progress that you just mentioned there, going through the, the youth teams and the various age groups until you found yourself uh, sat on the bench uh, for the first team. Yeah, um, that's a, that's honestly what I think it was because I, I didn't have any um, distractions. I didn't have any kind of doubt in myself to think, oh, I can't wait to go home and I'm I'm dying to go home. Like all I kept thinking was, I'm just loving being here. I'm just enjoying myself, and and this is all that I ever wanted to do. So, um, the more I was enjoying myself and the more comfortable I felt, I was still adapting to a lot of things, meeting new players and meeting a whole new kind of culture, really. But once I ended up um, hitting the ground running, and I just went from strength to strength, and again, I I, I look at it and say sometimes it is right place at right time, and. I was lucky enough to make an opportunity for the reserves um, near the end of that season when one of the second-year scholars pulled out with an injury and the manager threw me in and I only had five minutes to play and in that five minutes, I caught his eye a little bit and then you just progress and get like longer minutes and, and the only thing that he ever said to me was just defend and to me, that was like music to my ears because I knew that's something that I loved doing. So the fact that the manager himself let me be me and didn't try and change much of me. Just let let me be me in a, in a men's environment. It was it was perfect. And as I said, the the progression that I got was 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 something that I'll never forget. And to make me debut by sixteen, it was like it is something that I'll never forget. So your debut was in a match away at Watford. Um, unfortunately, Derby weren't doing too well at the time. I think they were three 0 down when you came on as a sub. I mean, were you expecting to come on or did you think at the age of 16 you're just there for the experience just to make up the numbers on the bench but then to, to get called up to actually go on the pitch? What was um, that like? Um, I think my family knew more than I did because the week before it was the last um, U-team game of the season and I was playing in that. My family were over and uh, my dad told me that Nigel Clough was speaking to him on, on top of the hill and this was after Derby's game and he said I'll see you next week and I looked at my dad and I was like well I'm home next week like the, the season's finished and he was like no I'll see you next week the manager said that he's going to have you on the bench with a force team and I was just like I, I just thought he was trying to wind me up like I didn't think that was going to be that and then the manager pulled me on the Monday I ended up training with the force team all week and 
yeah, at one stage I thought I was I was going to be there just for the experience and just for the, the travelling with a force team. But at the same time, um, there was Rob Bultz and Lewin Noyatanga playing centre-back. And Rob Bultz, obviously, everyone knows he's a striker. So I remember the manager told me after the game, or he told me a year later, that I was supposed to be starting that game. But he thought me at 16 starting in a game like that would have been too much for me. So he had bigger plans than actually just giving me the 30 minutes that he gave me. He was actually looking to start me in that game. So I think once I was there, I never knew that. And um, when I was sitting on the bench and they were three 0 at half time, I thought, well, maybe I'll get a five minutes here. I don't really, really know. And then I remember sitting there and one of the lads that I was sitting alongside, and he was making his debut as well. He said, "You're coming on after 60 minutes," and I'll. And I kind of looked at the clock and seen 58 minutes gone. And I thought, no, surely not. And the coach turned around and said, OK, get warm. And my warm-up was jog up and down the line. I stretched, I think, one. I, th I think I stretched one of my legs out, like my right hamstring, and that was it. And I just didn't know what to do. I just felt like I was going to get sick, like my, my stomach was doing somersaults. But again, once I went on, all the manager said to me was, head it and kick it and be a defender. And that's all that I did when I went on. I just won me tackles, won me headers, cleared one off the line, and he just allowed me to be me. And as as I said, it, it couldn't have gone any better. Now, don't get me wrong, I'd love to watch it back, and I'd probably be thinking, oh my God, what was I doing there? But at the time, it was it was the best thing that I ever done, and I loved every minute of it. And as I said, it was it, it was kind of something that cemented me in Derby at the, right there at the beginning with what I had to follow. So when you got onto the pitch and you started making your first few tackles. How did you think that it compared with the experience of football that you'd had up to that point playing for teams in the you know at the, at the younger age groups? Did did you find it much of a step up or, or did everything feel quite comfortable and natural? Um, a bit of both, really, because I was allowed to just be me from how I was in the under 16s to the 18s to the reserves, even back in Ireland. I just, I, I love to tackle, I love to head it, I love to be a defender. So there wasn't much in of a, of a, of a difference. I think the only difference was I was playing against people that were a lot more experienced. I was playing against people that knew how to use their body better, that had better movement. That used like I, I was playing against something that I used to. I wasn't playing against my own age. I had people that had vast experience ahead of me. So it was it was a learning curve. But again, I think because of the adrenaline and the day that it was, everything just kind of went in my favour. Any clearance I made went far. Every header that I went for, I won. And I look at it and just think, OK, it was it was a very good um, debut. And I, and I just really enjoyed it. Like the atmosphere of a stadium. And it was at that moment I knew, like, football is all I want like this is all I want if I can do this every single week please let me do it because that 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 kind of atmosphere and that experience and that kind of buzz that I got after it was something that like I said it, it's it's hard to replicate I don't think you can replicate but unfortunately you weren't able to go on this run in the first team after making your debut because um the issues with your your heart then came to light. How long after you'd made your debut um, did uh, that become apparent? Well, I made my debut um, last day of the season, which was like the fourth of May, I think, and went home that summer. And like I was, I was as high as can be, and I was on cloud nine. Everybody was congratulating me, saying how amazing it was, and I just couldn't wait to get back over it and start again. And once I got back over, I ended up having a routine heart scan and they found, like I'd done a couple of pre-season runs and they found that I had a leak in aortic valve and for that in itself, they told me that I won't need an operation for 60 years. They said people can live with this on a daily basis. It's something that might affect your life, but we'll just keep an eye on it. And like I said, the only question that I asked again was, can I play football? And they said, yeah, that's no problem. You can play. So then as, as as a month or two went on, it was around September time, um, got more scans, found out that it progressively got worse. And from what turned out to be 60, 50 years of needing an operation, they turned around and said, OK, but it might be 10, 20 years that you need an operation. It looks like it's progressed. So I ended up having another MRI scan. And I got told on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being extremely bad, 
one being not so bad. They said it was bleeding and leaking back into my heart um, around a seven or an eight. So I think that's when it's starting to grab people's attention. They say, okay, this is really serious. So then they referred me to a surgeon. So it was, I think, the middle of September in 2010 or 11. Um, I got referred to a surgeon. So there was me, me ma, me dad, the physio, and we were just sitting in the room waiting. And he walked into the room and he had like a model heart in his hand. And the one thing he turned around and said to me was, okay, Mark, your heart's three, three times the size of what it should be. And if you don't get this operation done now, you're going to die this year. So that, that was kind of a moment where I just kind of, it felt like you're not talking to me. Like I made my debut last year. How on earth has this just happened? Like how, like how has this happened? Like I don't feel any different. I have no symptoms. Like, does, what, what's going on? Like, you're reading someone else's scan. And then he goes, no. He said, um, basically, he said, your heart is um, your heart is dealing with the pressure it's under right now because you're a fit young lad. But um, it's only going to go for so long. And because your heart is a muscle, it's grown and it's grown. And it's going to get to a point where it's going to just stop. And I kind of felt <laughs> shocked. I didn't really know what to say. Um, and being 16, I just the only question that I asked him was, can I still play football? Because I don't understand. I never understood what open heart surgery was. I just thought it's another operation. I never really understood anything. So I just asked, can I still play? And I got told, you'd be lucky to play down in the park with your friends, let alone professionally. So I kind of said, but is there a chance that I can still play? He said, well, there's three different operations you can get and he said two of them will give you the opportunity to play potentially down the park with your friends or maybe a professional career if you want to push for it but he said there's no guarantee because he said with the strain that professional sport will put on your heart he said i'm not sure that the valve will um will bed in well for you so i just said okay what's that operation and he said you can get a pigskin valve in so i turned around and said yeah that's the one i want and he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah. I said, I want a pigskin valve because I said, if you said I can get back to fitness, then I'm going to give it everything because I know that I'd sit around and regret it. Yeah, that's incredible to have that put on you at the age of 16. I, you know, I was going to ask, how do you comprehend something like that at such a young age? And uh, from what you said, the, your, your only real priority was was to know whether or not you could continue to play football do you think if you'd had that same conversation now at the age you are now knowing what you know now that you would have made that same decision or do you think you would have perhaps been a bit more careful and thought right well going back to full-time football isn't going to be worth it yeah um that was the decision i was faced with two years ago I got told I could get another tissue valve in. I got told I could try and get back fit again. And it was the decision that I had to make. I think when I was 16, I was very naive. And be I don't like I, I put it down to if I didn't make me debut the season before and I didn't get that buzz and feel for fourth game football, I don't really know what decision I would have made. Yes, I loved football. But again, if I never had the feel for it in a fourth team environment, I would have never known. But because I had that feel against Watford and because... I knew that's all I wanted to do. Um, I just wanted to give it one go. And when I was 16, I always remember saying to my family and even to the doctor saying, I'm going to give this one shot. And if it doesn't quite work out how I wanted it, well, I don't look back with any regrets. And that's something that I'm a big believer in now because it's kind of molded me in a way of that's how my career panned, panned out and that's how things kind of progressed. And I don't live with a regret toward my career at all because, as I said, not a lot of people knew about it, but year after year that I had the heart operation, I had a heart scan every single season to see if I was allowed to play the following season. So I never knew what was actually going to be my last season. So I just kind of gave everything in that year and thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? Okay, I'm allowed to play next year and I'm allowed to play next year. And it was it was something that just moulded my career to a way of I got the best out of it in such a bad situation. And I don't look back with a regret. I just look back being proud of everything that I achieved. And I think, yeah, you can always look at it on the flip side to say maybe I could have achieved more if if these things didn't happen, if that didn't happen. But it was the cards I was dealt with. And 
I'm proud of everything that I achieved. Yeah, that's um, a really good attitude to to have. I think, and as you, as you rightly say, that you can you can only play the the cards in which you dealt. And I think under the circumstances, you did make the most of that. Just going back to that season there, at the age of sixteen, you were back in the team. You had a, a run in the team, and you were given a, a long term contract. Now, given the the health issues that you'd had, you know, you'd had the the heart operation. Was that something of a relief when you were given such um, a, a long contract there? Yeah, I think I, I think it was a it was a relief because it just showed that the manager what he thought of me really, and it it went to show what the club thought of me and the the faith that they showed in me to get back fit again. Because, like you say, you don't really know how people are going to react in these situations. It's something that wasn't really spoken about or unheard. Uh, wasn't really heard of for someone to have open heart surgery and get back playing again. So for them to show the belief in me like they did, it made me want to get back playing even more. And it made me want to do everything I could possibly for that club. So again, it was something where Neuser Clough as a manager, if he wasn't my manager, would I have had a career? I don't know because he's the one who showed the faith in me. If I wasn't at Derby County, who looked after me such true difficult times, would I have had a career? I don't know. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different things that, have helped me along the way that I'll never forget. And people like that in your life, like I say, you, it's it's like it was meant to happen. To have the manager there who cared about his players, to have a club there who cared about the players. And they cared about me. And once I ended up getting that contract, I wanted nothing more than to go out there and give me all for Derby as a club. But unfortunately, you did have a, a bit of a shocking run of injuries uh, that you did your your cruciate and you were out for a, a long time there what went through your mind when you had that injury you knew how long you were going to be out for uh, again having come back from the heart surgery it was difficult i think normal day-to-day -day injuries like an ankle sprain or anything like that they affected me more than the open heart surgery because the open heart surgery is something that was taken out of my hands. I, I can't affect that. I do anything about it. It was more the actual football and injuries because I knew my career was on such a time scale that I didn't know when it was going to end. To know I was missing out on valuable months and days and years of playing, it really affected me. And But again, because I went through open heart surgery at 16, that's why I say it moulded a lot of my career because I look at it and say, okay, if I, if I can get through open heart surgery, I can get back from a cruise ship. And if I can get back from a cruise ship, I can get back from a micro fracture. If I get back from this, if I can get back from open heart, I can do anything. And that's the only way that I ever looked at things. Yeah, I felt really down and I felt devastated for me seasons not to get the, as much of a run as I would have liked to get. But again, going through what I went through, there was nothing that was going to stop me. Because nobody once has turned around and said, Mark, you can't do it. And if someone said that you can't do it, then I would always say, OK, is there a small chance? And even if there was a small chance, I'd take that and go, OK, well, then that small chance is better than no chance at all. I looked at it in a way of thinking, OK, how can I better myself while I'm out injured? And that's something that somebody older pro has taught me is that what is it that you can do better? Or if you look at yourself now, while you have all this time to yourself, what can you do better? And... I knew that I wasn't the biggest or the strongest or the most filled out player. So I went into the gym and I made sure I, I worked on my physicality. And as I worked on that, it kind of passed in the months of of thinking I wish I was playing because I had something to focus on. And then once I got back playing, I came back a bigger and stronger player that kind of helped me in, me in my career. But then it wasn't long after that again. And you had another knee injury, which kept you out for, for several more months. I mean, at that point, did you think that you're always going to have a career now that is going to be hampered with these type of injuries? At one stage, yeah. At one, like I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that these thoughts never came in. Like it, but again, I know it sounds, I know it sounds so simple. But as much as I was down and out and thought, oh, here we go again, right? I'm getting a name for myself that Mark O'Brien is, is um. Mark O'Brien is, is injury prone, all the all the old stuff that, that people want to say about you. But I just looked at it in a way of saying, look, I've been through so much worse. 
I've had the worst thrown at me and I still got back playing. So this isn't gonna this isn't gonna stop me. Now I've had me down moments where you have your upset times thinking, why did this always have to happen to me? Like why always me? And, and everybody has their moments. So I'm not shy to say that I was someone who just was always positive about everything because I was devastated. I was down and out thinking is is football really for me? Like why am I doing this to myself? And but again you get that fire back in your stomach and you start thinking, no, this is definitely for me. And you start seeing the progression in, in your rehab and you start seeing things slowly but surely getting back to back together again. Because for the first 15 weeks, I was on a machine for eight hours a day that was only stretching my leg out and bending it. And I was literally just flexing my knee for me um, for eight hours a day. And that was something that was mentally challenging because you'd sit there through your whole day and wonder, how am I going to fit in these hours? And you think eight hours a day is something... But when I'm in the training ground, I'm not allowed to use it. So I have to finish in the training ground by three o'clock and then get home and use that for eight hours. So I never really had a life for God knows how many months. But when I knew what the end goal was going to be, there was going to be no stopping me. And as I said, I was just determined to keep myself going and to keep myself pushed towards the career that I wanted to have, as well as in the back of my mind knowing you know what every single year I'm having an open heart I'm having a scan and sometimes maybe when you look at the silver lining and everything these injuries protected me heart in a little bit that I was out for so long that maybe I didn't put my heart through certain strains that maybe prolonged my career more than so I, I can always look at it in different ways to try and see the positives in it but again uh, yeah I, I always looked at it in a way of saying if I can get over open heart surgery and that's why I say sometimes in the weirdest way, I'm thankful to have her at 16 because it helped me through a, a lot of different things that I had in my career. So you came back from injury and then you went up to Scotland uh, for a season. It was initially not going to be for the full season, but then it, it got extended uh, at Motherwell. Do you think that they saw the best out of you, you know, having uh, been out injured for a while? Um, I don't think Motherwell probably seen the best of me. Um. I think they, they they got like certain games with me, but at the same time, I don't think they got the best, which I think everybody has spells like that in their career where you have a couple of good games, not so good games, and then your confidence goes. And as I said, I, I was kind of in limbo where I didn't want to leave Derby. I didn't want to come away from Derby. They, they helped me through so much, and it felt like such a comfort zone for me. So I was out of my comfort zone, and it was something so new for me. And again... I loved every minute up there. Um, you get to play against your Celtics and you get to meet new people. And I met some great lads up there and I get along with really well. But it was just something where a change of manager comes in. He has his own different ideas. And if you don't match up to the ideas that he wants, then that's just football. And it's the harsh reality of, footballs that I, of football that I had to learn. And it wasn't something that I wanted. But you have to just go with it. And, and that's, that's how kind of cutthroat football can be for a manager that wanted me there when he first signed me to then a new manager coming in and not wanting me it's 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 business at the end of the day and, and, and I had to learn that really quick So when you came back from Motherwell that was the end of your contract at Derby and then you're on the move again you're looking for somewhere new now you moved on to Luton who were in League 2 at the time now, given that you'd played quite a lot of games in the championship, albeit in between um, a couple of significant in injuries, were there any reservations about dropping down to League Two, even though Luton, you know, arguably are a championship club, but that's the position they were in at the time? Yeah, there was obviously reservations about it, but again, I wasn't someone that ever really looked at my career in that way to say, okay, I'm not taking a step back, I'm not doing this. If someone wanted to give me games of football, I was more than happy to play. Because the way I looked at it was, I moved away from Ireland to play football. And I moved away from Ireland that, it, I, th there wouldn't be any point in me leaving my family if I didn't if I didn't want to, if I didn't play football. There was no point in leaving Ireland. So when Luton came in, um, I was more than happy to sign there. Um, I signed under a manager, John Still, and he left after six months. So um, I played a couple of games here and there, and some good, not some not so good. But 
there was we had so many players there was so many tactics to, like chopping and changing for cup games and everything so it was something where you had to just bide your time and hopefully get yourself into the team but always stay involved and again um, I look at it and say a change of manager is something that I kind of looked at and thought oh, here we go again from what happened at Motherwell to happening now and this this time around was a kind of a, a different feel to it all together because I wasn't injured um, I still had a year and a half left in me deal um, there was so much to it that I think at Motherwell I got given the opportunity to prove to the manager if I could play or not and he put me back into the team but with the manager at Luton he just didn't want me there whatsoever didn't play me didn't give me a minute and that's something that I had to learn is something that knocked me confidence really a lot yeah so that was Nathan Jones uh, who was there at the time, who is revered uh, at Luton. He's, he's there um, at, in his second spell uh, in charge at the moment. But yeah, it's it's interesting what you say there that uh, previously you had the injuries and you knew that you had to, you had to bide your time and uh, perhaps have to prove yourself uh, again. But if you're not being given that opportunity, then you're in, in a really difficult position, especially if you've got another year and a half left uh, on your on your contract uh, to run down so you were on the move again and this time you joined Southport on loan but that was another division below I know you say you don't necessarily look at the teams and, and, the, and the leagues but were there thoughts crossing your mind at this point that you're thinking you're going to end up dropping out of the league and you, you're going to become a, a non-league player yeah um, because of how my confidence was feeling at Luton because of how things were looking and obviously the manager not giving me a minute on the pitch and not really wanting me in there. So I kinda I had to contemplate with the with the theory of maybe I am gonna have to play non league. And don't get me wrong, I'm not sitting there saying that just because I wanted to play football I would have played anywhere. It was still a step back that I didn't really want to take. But I knew I had to if I wanted to prove myself again and it was at that stage that there was a manager giving me a chance to prove myself. And it was the best decision that I made because this is what I'm saying about the, the stuff at Luton where Nathan Jones told me to go out and play, go out on loan for seven for seven games, seven games in a month. Told me to go out on loan for a month, keep fit, maybe have the opportunity of playing when I get back and then played seven games under Dino Marmaria, who was the manager for Southport at the time. And I was lucky enough to play those seven games, done really well with Southport and then got back again and the Luton manager again just isolated me and telling me no your squad number's gone um, you're on the transfer list and again not get given the opportunity to at least if I made the mistakes on the pitch then it's my fault and I can hold my own hands up and that's the and that's the only kind of little piece that I would say I hold against them but again I understand football's a business and you have to just kind of take it on the chin and that's how football works sometimes and I am uh, but taking that step back is something that kind of helped me going forward because I done well under Dino Marmory and then he became assistant manager in Newport County, and then I texted him when I knew Luton wanted me gone, and then he got me in at Newport County and it was the best move that I've ever made. Looking at uh, what you've achieved there over the past uh, few years, it, it sounds like you really found a home uh, at Newport, uh, having um, left uh, Derby where you felt really comfortable uh, beforehand. But when you got to Newport, they were in a, a pretty, pretty dire position. Um, were they cut adrift at the bottom of League Two when you arrived there in uh, January of twenty seventeen? Yeah, when I when when I arrived, um, I remember I had a meeting with Graham Wesley before I arrived, and he was telling me how how far off the pace they were. He was telling me that he was bringing in a lot of new signings that he wanted to progressed the team and he wanted to save from relegation and it's going to be a massive thing if they keep themselves out of relegation um, asked me if I wanted to come along for the challenge um, yeah so there, w there was a lot to it that it wasn't really just a straightforward decision but again it was League 2 football I would have been back in the league I knew I was going to go in to actually play so I think when you have to at some stage back yourself no matter how low your confidence is you have to kind of dig it out of yourself a little bit to say okay I actually believe in what I am or I believe in the player that I am. I've done good things. Do you know what? I can do this. And that's something that 
it took it, it took a lot for me to it took a lot for me inside to agree to it but for a front i put my hand straight out and i shook his hand and i said yeah can't wait to come in but he didn't have to know how low on confidence i was because i didn't play for six months but again yeah they were they were really cut adrift and i remember graham wesley left and michael flynn came in and we were 11 points away from safety with 12 games to go which i think if anybody's looking at statistics like that we'll look at it and say okay we're just we're basically down just not mathematically down so we just kept plodding along and until that table told us we were relegated we were just going to keep picking up results we were going to keep challenging and we were going to keep pushing everything forward and i look at it now and said that we we ended up doing something miraculous that not a lot of people i think would have had but we had a lot of players that were brought in on the scale of they were looking to rebuild their careers they were looking to mold themselves again so everybody had a point to prove whether it was me who needed and wanted to prove myself again and other lads who were coming in to prove themselves. So he made some really good signings for the running that we had. That was a lot of character that was needed and everybody showed a lot of character that time. And as I said, I was lucky enough and I feel as though moments like that are meant for certain aspects of people. And I was lucky enough that it fell to me and I looked at it and thought, well, maybe that moment was meant for me to say, yeah, do you know what? I actually am still an okay player. I can still play. And again, to score the goal that, that saved the club from relegation at the end of that season from the six months previous I had to that was was like a, it felt like a dream. You went down in Newport history when you scored that last minute goal against Notts County on the final day of the season and it was that goal that secured Newport's place in the league. I mean how how did that feel. I mean, did you comprehend the the magnitude of of scoring that goal at the time? Like in all fairness, I I never really knew like what what that goal was going to mean. Like I just knew it was six months hard graft by a lot of people. I just knew that we had a group of lads that just gave everything for that six months, and I never really understood the significance of the goal. Um, the reason probably why the celebrations were so mad. Yes, we beat relegation. But it was my fourth professional goal, so even at that, I kind of looked at it and thought, "Oh, that's great! Like I got the score, I got the score on my fourth goal." But it was only a year or two later that you kind of have the community people come over to you. You have the background staffs, you have academy staff, you have people say to you, "Now look, like you don't realize it, but you saved my job. You don't realize it. If you never scored that goal, we wouldn't be here." And I'm like, "What? Like I didn't realize how." how significant the goal was. Like it meant people's livelihoods, it meant people's lives, it meant the town not having that club anymore, it meant the club could end up folding and there was so much to it that yeah, it, it was it was amazing to, to know that like I was I was part of that. Like there was, there's so many more of us that were part of it. But to know that like I scored that goal and everything that I've had happened from the age of sixteen till then, I was kinda of looking at it saying, Do you know what? This is why I wanted to be in football for moments like this. So I'm glad I never gave up because it does all work and swing and roundabouts that it came back all in my favour again. It It's difficult for supporters to perhaps appreciate that because if we're watching the game in the stands or if we're watching it on TV, all we see is it's that theatre on the pitch. You see that last minute winner, you know, you get that, that rush and you feel that high of of witnessing that uh, last minute winning goal but it's it's all the stuff that goes on in the background like like you've just mentioned there you know real life stuff that affects real people on the day-to-day basis but uh, again it's it's something that's you know you're gonna always have that now you you will always be that hero in Newport because you were the person who kept them in the league against all odds on the last day of the season so uh, I don't think uh, you, you'll ever be forgotten uh, in, <laughs> in Newport <laughs> for that reason but um, that wasn't the end of the uh, you know the, the big games there you, you played against Manchester City in the FA Cup during the, the, the run um, where Newport knocked out uh, Leicester and Middlesbrough uh, along the way um, what was it like to test yourself against arguably some of the best players in the world honestly it was it's it's one of the best experiences that i've ever had um 
I remember turning up for the game and, and, and you see the players like kind of walking in and you're thinking, OK, they've brought a couple of big time lads and you don't really know what team they're going to play. Um, you're excited for the game, but then also nervous because they beat Chelsea 5-0 at Stamford Bridge the season or the, the week before. So you're thinking, if they can do that to Chelsea, they can come to, to Rodney Parade and, and they, they could get whatever score they wanted. But I remember we went out and when you're standing there and you're looking across at them for the minute of silence that we had and you're just standing there thinking, OK, we're playing against these. There was Mares, Jesus, there's Sané, um, there's Bernardo, oh, there's Bernardo Silva on the bench, there's David Silva who's playing. This It's just like the array of players that we had to play against was, was frightening and to know that like you were playing against them, you just realise that there isn't much of a step up, but the step up that there is, is that they just know their positioning, they're a lot more comfortable on the ball and their fitness levels. Like, we can play 46 games a season, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, but the intensity that they play at is just so much higher. And you can see why they are all world, like why they all are world class. And to get a chance to even come up against them, to be nil nil at half time, was kind of like a dream to think, is this actually happening? Could we actually cut? cause an upset like that's when we were kind of flying with confidence that year to think anyone who comes to Rodney Parade it's our little fortress we can create any upset and when you're nil nil at half time at Man City you start having that small glimpse of belief thinking could we actually do this but again like obviously that night itself wasn't meant but we done ourselves proud and I think we all gave a real good account of ourselves but ultimately, all good things have to come to an end. And in June 2020, you had to make the decision to retire from playing. So how did that uh, come about? Well, um, it was during COVID, um, the very first lockdown. And I remember uh, we had to get given an off like an, an, an off-season programme because we never knew, well, nobody knew what COVID was at the time. So um, we were going out and uh, me and one of the other lads, we were just doing cycling out and about and just keeping myself fit, doing home workouts as you do. And one of the days that I ended up um, doing them, I started getting like um, really strong and strange palpitations in my chest. And in those palpitations, I really felt something was different. Um, I was starting to get like me, me neck was was really throbbing, um, and I just felt like that something wasn't right. And I, when I'd go to bed at night and I'm laying on my left hand side, I I couldn't lay on my left hand side because I'd keep getting a, a quick jolt of whatever was happening in my chest. So I didn't really know what was what was going on, and I was getting really worried about it. So I spoke with the club doctor through a text, and he told me it's probably nothing to worry about. Um. He said that a lot of people get palpitations and these things just happen and you had just gone a couple of months ago, everything is totally fine. And um, so I just kind of carried on training, carried on cycling. But again, they just weren't leaving me and they were getting, I wouldn't say progressively worse, but they, they were not leaving me whatsoever. And at the time, um, I texted them again and I was telling them, oh, I'm really worried about this. And I was feeling a lot more fatigued. Um, even though I'm doing fitness work, I'm feeling a lot more fatigued. So I was kind of getting really worried and panicked about it. So then I went in um, the club doctor, Daniel Vaughan, who was amazing for me. I know he mean him, Tom Gittos, who's the physio, Lewis Bins. They, they, these people are, are people that like I will hold as, as great mates for the rest of my life. Um, and the club doctor, he got me involved with um, Cardiff Spire Hospital and I had a routine heart scan because I wasn't really knowing what was happening and I found out that the aortic valve was leaking again. So at that time um I sat with the I sat with the specialist and he told me Mark it's lead it's leaking quite badly. And it was the exact same words I've heard when I was sixteen and I kind of just sat there and I remember I, I, I said to the to the specialist, I can't play anymore. And he told me, Mark, it's not as serious like he said it's not like that there's there's operations out there that, that you can get tissue valves in and you can, can carry on playing. And I said, no. I said, I had the tissue valve done when I was 16. I said, I'm not doing it again. I made it made a, a pact with myself and my family that if this happens again, 
or when it happens again, I'm having to retire. And I told him that that's the decision I'm going with. Even though this was something that you'd been expecting for about the past 11 years, how did the realisation that your playing career had come to an end affect your mental health? I broke into tears. I really, really broke into tears and I was so, so devastated. I I, I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, my mum had to fly over and when she flew over, I... I kind of just broke into tears again. Like I just didn't know how to handle it because I, I just knew football was coming to an end. But again, also, I was crying because I didn't want open heart surgery again. Because you just when you feel as though you're starting to forget about it, even though it's 11 years after, you still think to yourself, OK, I might get another year out of this valve. There was always, I always thought I was going to be prepared for it because I knew of the circumstances my whole career and life has been. But I was never prepared for it. And... When I got told that um, I was going to have the open heart surgery, I got admitted into the hospital around June time. And then in June, during COVID, um, no family were allowed in the hospital with me. They were kind of a FaceTime away from everybody. And again, it was difficult. It was like really, really difficult. But again, you're trying to reassure everyone, oh, I'm going to be fine. Everything will be fine. But then a lot went on in the hospital that um, they told me that I was really on the brink of something really terribly going wrong and that really like scared me and it created a lot of anxieties and and panics that I've never really had before and I went in I had the operation which I had the metallic valve put in and I just knew that once I got I was I just wanted to be over the finish line of having the operation finished so then as I was dealing with the whole recovery of of the operation um which I thought was really difficult um because I think not being it's not being naive and not being 16 and understanding the significance of everything that's happening, I think really went against me because I understood everything that the doctor was saying to me. I understood everything specialists were saying to me and it, everything scared me. And that time is something where I really underestimated how, how your mind can work and how your mind can play tricks on you for a lot of different things. And... I remember once I come out of hospital, three, four months after the operation, the club doctor, Daniel Vaughan, and as I said, the, the sports physio um, and the sports therapist, um, Lewis Bins and Thomas Gittos, they, they literally looked after me. Like, stuff that they didn't have to do. Like, I'd, they'd be at the end of a phone call if I needed them. The doctor would check me once a week, just listen to me, Val, to reassure me everything's okay. Um, the physio would take me out on jogs just to try and get me some sort of fitness back again like they were really putting themselves out of the way for me and it just went to show me that there's a lot of people out there that actually really care for me and really care for my well-being and care for just me as a person and even Newport as a club I was lucky again that they were a club like Derby County that looked after their players as a fan base looked after their players and again I, it I look at it and say it's not really a coincidence that the two major things that have happened in my life are at the happening at clubs that really look after the players. So, like I am genuinely grateful for for everything that they've done for me. And again, I think I ended up falling into depression, which is something that I never really I never understood. I had anxiety and panic attacks, which I never understood. I had health anxiety and PTSD and traumas and stuff that I never understood and I had a lot of counselling to do. Um I sat down with one of the one of the, the players, Matty Dolan, and he was somebody that he went through panic attacks when he was younger and he could actually relate to me on a lot of things and he was there for me and he was like a he was like a another brother to me. And he is like a family member to me now and Mickey Demetrio, another player for Newport. He's like a family member to me. These people were looking after me when they didn't have to. But at the same time, they, they took it upon their own backs to, to want to help me because, as I say, sometimes um, it's a reflection on yourself how people treat you. So And, and, and everyone was there for me. So I kind of took it as, as something that, you know what, I'm a really lucky person to have all these people there to, to care for me. I still have days of struggling. But... I know how to handle it a lot better and I know that speaking and, and, and saying what I need to say 
helps me more. And again, it just it's to bring the reality back to footballers are just normal people as well. Like we have our our own stories, we have our own troubles, just as well as everybody else. And like I said, if I'm able to share my troubles with other people and people can relate to me and it helps other people, then that's my hopeful new purpose in life to do. Yeah, it's great to hear that uh, you are coming out of the other side and uh, that you had such a, a close group of, well, not just workmates uh, on the team, but genuine friends uh, who really took it upon themselves to, to look after you and, and help you get through that um, that really difficult period. Can you tell us a, a bit about the current role that you have at uh, Newport? Well, what I'm doing now at Newport, they have me as an ambassadorial role, which um, I help on match days um, and the training ground. I help around with help with the with the kit and everything out, out onto the pitch and with the facilities that they've got. Um, I help with the younger lads who are stepping through to a force team um, environment to try and help them along and, and, and show them certain ways. I kind of sit there and do help the manager be the middleman between him and the players where if they don't want to tell him certain things, but they speak to me and I can kind of inform them on, on little aspects of things to say, maybe like this person struggling at home, something that the manager might understand to why certain things might be going on and just to kind of still be in and around the building to help the club as, as best as I can and what I can do. And also, um, I'm doing keynote speaking as well. So doing keynote speaking on a lot of different things, whether that's workshops and whether it's speaking on resilience or adversities in life and, and general life in, in itself and even a sport in life as well. So doing a lot of keynote speaking now, which is which has been brilliant. And I do a lot of media stuff as well with um, BBC Wales. I do a lot of commentary and that's something that has had, I've, I've really loved and really enjoyed. So I, I, I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel where there's life after football and, and it's bringing more excitement to me than it than it was a, uh, a year previous. Do you think that's helping you make that transition now from being a player to having to, I suppose for want of a, be a better phrase, uh, work a regular job? Yeah, I, th I think it has helped me because I think anybody can, can agree when you're in football, you're in your own little bubble, in your own little world. Um, and I think when that's all you know, it's a scary kind of transition to make think if you have to come straight out of that into, as you said, like a normal nine to five job. It's a very difficult transition. So the fact that I can still work in football as well as progress certain other aspects of my life elsewhere and to do other certain things, it, it's it's made it so much better. And that's why I can never thank Newport County enough. And Michael Flynn, when he was here, Wayne Hatswell, and even the new manager now, James Robbery, that people that, have given me the opportunity to be able to progress my life elsewhere, but then also keep me in a football environment where they realise the value I can bring to a certain team or bring to the club themselves with the history of stuff that we've kind of gathered ourselves in the last five years to be part of that and hopefully bring more success to the club in in, in years to come. So again, it's, it's, it's great to be at the club that I'm at. But then also, I am looking to progress myself elsewhere in the keynote speaking that I've started as well. It is great to hear that you're so involved on a day-to-day -day basis and that you've got uh, plenty to work on and plenty to look forward to in future. Now, if anybody wants to find out more about you, if they want to get in touch with you, if they want to find out more about, for example, the, the keynote speaking that you just mentioned there, Where's the best place for them to do that? Uh, I'd say the best place to do it would be Twitter and LinkedIn are the two main places where like there's a lot of stuff that I, I post on there and I get back to a lot of people who want to reach out to me there. So Twitter and LinkedIn, I'd say. Okay, great. So I'll get the 
the links from you and I can put them in the in the show notes there so uh, everybody uh, has uh, easy access to those so uh, just to wrap things up but again I want to thank you for you know taking time out to uh, to speak with me today and to, to feature uh, on the episode and um, I, I sincerely mean it when uh, I wish you all the best uh, for the future and uh, I look forward to uh, following what you're doing next on the uh, on LinkedIn and uh, social media. So thank you once again, and um, hopefully I'll, I'll chat with you again sometime. Honestly, lovely. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. If you enjoy Engage, please show your support at engagersclub.com and check out more episodes at engageshow.com. Also, if you have a spare moment, please rate and review the show. Stay engaged. <laughs>